Thanks for the introduction there, and good afternoon, everybody. It's, certainly, it's great to be here. Thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, as I just mentioned, my name is James Ford. I'm a professor in geography at McGill, and my colleague here is uh, Tristan Pierce, who's a research fellow at the, Sun the Sunshine Coast. And together, we've been working in the Arctic now for, for over a decade. I began working in the north in 2002, and Tristan followed soon after, I think, in 2003. In, in, in and we've been working in small communities that are very different than Australia, where we work, it's... It's very, very cold for one, it's the Arctic. Uh, the, the average temperatures where we work in the wintertime is about minus 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, it gets to a high of about plus 10 in the summertime. So uh, it's an environment to which sea ice is very important. Uh, the communities where we work, the ocean is frozen for about eight to nine months of the year. So not too good for surfing, uh, but it's probably too cold to surf, to surf anyway, but good for transportation. The, the, the anyways we work with use the ice for, 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 get, for getting around. So we've been working in the Arctic for about for over, over a decade now, and what we're going to do in this, this, this presentation is really recollect on some of our research, some of the findings, and pose the question, can we adapt to climate change in the Canadian uh, Arctic? So firstly, a bit, of, a bit of context about the Arctic and, and climate change. As was just mentioned, you know, it's the Arctic where we really are seeing quite significant climate change. If we look at temperature data sets uh, over the last 30 years, what we see is that temperatures in the circumpolar north are increasing about three times the global, the global rate of temperature increase. So we've seen about a 0 0.6 degree Celsius increase in temperature per decade since 1983 in, in, in the Arctic region. That's for the region as a whole. There's certain parts of the Arctic which are warming even faster than that. So for instance, in the communities that we work in, in the Canadian north, we've seen temperature changes of about five degrees Celsius in the last 30 or so years, which is huge. So when globally we talk about climate change, we're often talking about climate change as a, a future issue, a future concern. Yet in the Arctic, these changes are happening today. And they've been happening for the last decade. Uh, so, um, and we do believe, the science believes, that these changes are definitely indicative of human-induced climate change. So we, of, we often hear people talking about the Arctic as a minus canary of climate change because we're already seeing the climate change signal uh, in this region. Now, if we look at the impacts that climate change is having on biophysical systems, we see some of the most pronounced impacts on the, on the sea ice. As I just mentioned, sea ice is an integral part of life in the Arctic, with the ocean being frozen for a significant portion uh, of the year. It's an important platform for hunting. It's also an important platform for, for transportation. And what we see is significant change in sea ice over the last three decades. So if we look at the Arctic Ocean, uh, in the Arctic Ocean, we have a permanent ice cap which doesn't melt. The extent of, that, of the ice cap has been decreasing quite significantly over the last 30 years. In fact, we've seen about an 11.5% 11, 11 decrease since 1979. This is what it looks like in, 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 in graph form. Uh, this is taken from, from satellite data from NASA. They've been observing the spatial extent of Arctic Ocean sea ice since the late 1970s. What we see is this quite significant downward trend. Uh, we look at 2012, for instance, that was the lowest on record, lowest spatial extent on record by a long way. The ice extent in this one year was about half of the average extent in the, the, 19, the 1980s and 1990s. Um, now, in 2013, we saw the extent of the ice actually increasing a little bit, and we, we heard some climate skeptics saying this was indicative of climate change ending and so forth. Yet, 2013 was still the sixth lowest year for spatial extent of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And accompanying these changes in the extent is also a reduction in thickness. Across the Arctic, we're seeing a loss, the loss of a huge amount of volume in ice over the last three decades as well. We're also seeing the ice freezing up later in the year and breaking up earlier in the year. So overall, there's more open water. So the sea ice has been observed widely by the scientific community. Also, the people who live in the Arctic also recount these huge changes that, that, that they've seen in the sea ice in recent decades. Yeah, it's not just sea ice where we're seeing impacts of climate change. We're also seeing impacts on permafrost. In the Arctic, uh, a significant portion of the land is frozen year-round. With warming temperatures, this permafrost is melting with implications for infrastructure, for housing, for pipelines, for roadways, uh, and so forth, with quite significant economic impact. We're seeing an increase in coastal erosion. Again, especially in the Western Arctic, Alaska and the Western Canadian Arctic, where we're seeing sea level rise, we're seeing increasing storminess in the fall time. And with less, less sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, those, the wind and the waves have much longer distance to build up. And so we're seeing a significance of ocean across Western, the Western Arctic, in some cases threatening the very viability of communities. 
And we're also seeing impacts of climate change on a variety of animal species um, in terms of population numbers, population health, and migration, migration timing. So we're already seeing a very clear signal of climate change impacts really across the northern uh, uh, region. And these impacts are projected to, to continue. This is some of the latest information, some of the latest models here from the IPCC fifth assessment report. Uh, both these models simulate what temperatures, temperatures may look like by the end of the century. What, the one here, RCP 2.6, on the left here, that's a low, emissions, a low emissions scenario, whereas the one on the right is a high emissions scenario. Both models indicate quite significant change for the Arctic, anywhere between an increase of 2 degrees Celsius to in excess of 7 degrees Celsius globally by the end of the century. And as these, these models show, again, it's the Arctic where we want to see the most pronounced change. Again, this idea of the Arctic being a minus canary of climate change. And these changes will, will have impacts. Now, these impacts will vary across the Arctic. You know, and the Arctic has a population of, of indigenous peoples and also non-indigenous peoples. Uh, and on the whole, we believe the impacts will be negative. And already, we're, already we're seeing you know, increasing coastal erosion threatening the very viability of communities. Melting permafrost having significant economic impacts. We're seeing the hunting and fishing activities of subsistence hunters uh, across the Arctic being affected in negative ways. Yet we must also recognize that climate change may also bring benefits. Uh, what we're seeing in the Canadian Arctic is that as the sea ice recedes, we have more open water, it's increasing the season for shipping. It's improving shipping access to communities and also for, for resource development uh, as, 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 as well. But overall, we do believe as overall that the impact will be, will be negative for the region. So the question then becomes, well, how do we address these risks? The Arctic climate is changing. It's changing fast. It's having impacts. It's going to continue to change in the future. What can we do about it? Well, on the one hand, this is how we normally address climate change. It's through mitigation. It's about reducing greenhouse gas emissions that are causing the climate to change. The more we mitigate, the less impacts we're going to see. So that's important. But the work that we do is really focused on, on adaptation. And adaptation has really emerged over the last five or so years as a key component of climate change policy. And adaptation is about finding ways to reduce the negative impacts of climate change and take advantage of new opportunities uh, that may arise. And adaptation is becoming increasingly important in climate change policy for a number of reasons. One of which is that the climate is going to change whatever we do. Even if we stopped emissions overnight, we would still see some climate change in the future. We're already seeing climate change impacts today as well. And adaptation can help us reduce our vulnerability to those impacts. So across the board, both internationally, uh, nationally, and also at local levels, we're seeing adaptation really emerging as a major component of climate change uh, uh, policy. Well, the question then becomes, if adaptation is important, the question then becomes, can we adapt? And this is a question which really underpins the work that myself and Tristan do. And, and to answer this question, we need to understand the nature of vulnerability to climate change. You know, what makes people, communities, regions vulnerable? And this, and this is a question that's not just about how the climate's going to change. Because people's vulnerability depends not, not only on climate change impacts, it also depends on how people interact with those changes. And that interaction and response is affected by a variety of social and cultural and economic factors, which I'm going to show you in a few slides' time. So me and Tristan, our work is mostly asking this question, can we adapt? In the context of the Canadian Arctic, we work with small Inuit communities, uh, although we also have projects in the Peruvian Amazon and also Uganda as well. But we're not going to be talking about that to, to, to today. And the majority of our, of our research today has been doing individual case studies, so working very closely with communities, doing interviews, focus groups, trying to find out how people interact with the environment and how climate change comes in in the context of ongoing social, cultural, and economic changes. It's work that depends upon developing very strong relationships with, with, with communities, putting time in the field to really get to understand how climate comes in. And this work tells us if we can adapt in a specific location. So my, myself and Tristan, we know a lot about the communities in which we work. We know that what causes their vulnerability and so forth. But what about the big, bigger picture? Can we generalize? Can we generalize from this case study research to a regional scale? For instance, for the scale of the Arctic in Canada as a, as a, as a whole. Now, the project I'm going to talk about today tried to do that. We basically did a meta-analysis. We brought together multiple case studies on vulnerability to climate change in the Canadian Arctic to try and find out what were the key drivers of vulnerability 
and resilience. Were they consistent across the case studies? What, what were some of the insights that we could derive from this very, very detailed community-based work? What insights could we derive at this kind of more regional uh, uh, scale? So the project, what we did is we brought together research from 20 different communities, research of myself, of Tristan, and also some of our colleagues and, and our students. And these communities really form a transect across the Canadian Arctic. This is Arctic Canada. These are the four Inuit administered regions. And communities here, they range in size from 100 people in Saks Harbor to about 7,000 people in the Calouette in the, in the west. And this is a huge area. It's about, whew, about 35% of the Canadian landmass, um, of which about 100,000 people live there, of whom about 55,000 are, 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 are Inuit. So it's very remote. Virtually all these communities, are, they're, they're flying communities. Uh, they're very, very, very remote. They often have a strong dependence upon subsistence hunting. For Inuit, hunting is more than just a hobby. It's a way of life. The food that people hunt underpins food security and food systems. Uh, there's also a very strong cultural value of, of hunting as well. And for many people, it's an important livelihood activity. That's the communities in which we worked. We worked in 20 of these communities, capturing about 25% of the Inuit population in, in, in Canada. Uh, the work took place over about a decade. It involved about 800 in-depth interviews with Inuit. And these are interviews. These aren't surveys. These are in-depth interviews, some of them lasting two, three, four hours in, in, in length, trying to really understand how Inuit interact with their environment and the various factors which affect that. We also did interviews with policymakers, we did focus groups, photo voice, a variety of methods to really understand the current vulnerability to, to climate change. We also integrated into this some modeling as well to ask the question how many climate change, how many the climate change in, in, in the future. So what did we what did we find? Well, firstly, let's look at the the subsistence sector, because as I mentioned before, the subsistence economy is of extreme importance to, to, to Inuit. Um, it's also you know, very, very sensitive to, to the effects of climate change. In the Arctic, there are very, very few roads. Hunting takes place. People access their hunting areas by semi-permanent hunting trails. These are trails on the sea ice, trails on the snow. Each year when those trails disappear, when the ice melts and the snow, uh, the snow melts. So what we see is that in the Inuit hunting economy is very sensitive to the effects of climate change because of the nature of people's land use activities. And already across the Arctic, across our communities, what we've been seeing is constrained access to hunting and fishing areas. Uh, again, because of changes that we're seeing in the ice. Uh, one of the biggest impacts is the fact that when the ice starts to form, so you can no longer use a boat, the time at which it takes to reach a thickness at which it can be safely used on a snowmobile is increasing. So one of the communities in which I work, Iglulik, it's about six weeks, for about six weeks of the year longer, people are stuck in the community because of the changes in the ice conditions that we're seeing. And that's a direct result of changes in temperature and also changes in wind patterns as, as, as well. So we're seeing constrained access to hunting and fishing locations because of sea ice change. We're also seeing enhanced danger of engaging in land-based activities. And you know, every, week, every, every month we hear of people, be it full-time hunters or other people who are traveling on the, on the ice, getting into danger in areas where normally the ice is safe and thick, but with changing ice dynamics, it's becoming more dangerous. And we've, we've, there's been cases of people falling through the ice in areas where it's normally thick and getting into, getting into difficulties. Yet, when we look at how Inuit interact with the environment, people are not passive in the face of a changing climate. And this is true not just of the Inuit in the Arctic. Wherever you work, people are not passive in the face of changing environmental conditions. They, they respond in a variety of ways. And in our work in the Arctic, we've documented numerous adaptations being utilized by, by people, by land-based, by people, by, 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 by hunters. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is the development of new transportation routes on the sea ice, for instance. So instead of going directly from a to point A to point B, people will take routes that, that hook, hook the coastline where the ice forms a solid, solid base uh, uh, first. Just a little aside here, this is one of the projects that we've been working on in the community of Akalawet. And This is a long-term project. It's, it's been going for about five years. And what we're trying to do is get a real-time understanding of how Inuit interact with changes in sea ice, snow, weather, and animal patterns. What we've done is basically we've got three hunters who work for us full time. We've given them GPS units. Every time they go hunting, they take those GPS with them. And so we've built up a picture of their land use, 
of where they're, how they're using the, the ice and the land, and how this varies throughout the year. Every two weeks, they come in and they have their GPS uh, routes downloaded onto a computer. They also ask a series of questions. Where have you been hunting? What challenges have you faced? And so forth. And through this work, we begin to really develop a really in-depth, real-time picture of how Inuits are interacting with changing conditions and the various adaptations and response options that they're using uh, with, those, with those changes. Just an example here of some of the maps that we're doing. We're doing some Google Earth mapping with, with this project. Just to give you some context of the kind of environment in which we're, in which we're working, uh, this is the, the ice edge, the flow edge. This is the flow edge uh, off the Calouette with my, my hunting team. Very common area for people to hunt on the, on the, on the ice edge. People be hunting seals uh, mostly at this location. Now, this is one of the maps that we've produced uh, from this work. It's a map capturing the main trails that people are using. And it's also overlaying on this some of the main risks that climate change is posing. So here we see locations. I'm not going to laser on the here, but you'll see that this area of you know, the, you know, the area where it's kind of with, with lines is one of the areas where we're seeing constrained access because of changing ice conditions. These areas uh, have always been, have always had thin ice. Uh, what we're seeing with warming temperatures is the thin ice basically isn't forming ice at all. And it's happening in key, key kind of choke points on the transportation routes, affecting access to the outer bay and affecting access to the, the caribou hunting grounds on the peninsula uh, 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 there. So again, what, what this project has enabled us to do is really get a, a real-time understanding of how, how change is interacting with the, with the harvesting economy in this, in this one community. Um, we're seeing other adaptations being used. We're seeing the utilization of new technology. So for instance, hunters taking along with them satellite phones in expectation that they may get into dangerous circumstances and may need to request help in response to more open water in the summertime, which is a big benefit for, 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 for hunters. Uh, people are using more boats, for instance, to access the hunting areas. Uh, we're also seeing alterations to hunting behavior. The timing at which certain species are harvested and the location at which they're harvested is changing, changing in response to changes in, in, in access. And the fact that Inuits are adapting to change should really come as no surprise because the Inuits have lived in the Arctic for millennia. And the Arctic climate is anything but stable. It's always changing on, on decadal, interdecadal time scales. There's a huge history in the Arctic of, of significant environmental change and Inuit adaptation. And there's a variety of cultural traits that have, that have developed amongst Inuits, which underpin their resilience or adaptive capacity to deal with change. Things like resource use flexibility. You know, people use the environment opportunistically, hunting what is available, when it's available, and where it's available, which allows Inuit to modify what they're doing in response to the environmental conditions. Uh, we also have traditional knowledge. I'm not going to talk too much about this here because Tristan's going to talk at the end a bit about the role of traditional knowledge in helping Inuits adapt to climate change. But basically knowledge about the animals, animal behavior, knowledge about the land, about survival skills, about how to identify dangerous conditions continues to underpin the ability of Inuit to adapt to changing conditions. So adaptation is taking place. And Inuit society has quite significant adaptive capacity but there are challenges as, as well. So when we look at the new transportation routes being developed, often these involve people traveling much further. In one of the communities, we estimated that the adaptations being undertaken basically required people to travel twice as far to access those areas. Longer distance traveling means more use of gas. It's costing much more. And for Inuit hunters, many of them are living very close to the poverty line. And many people are not able to afford this additional cost of, of, of hunting required by these responses. Likewise, in the summertime, what we're seeing is increasing use of boats to access hunting areas, to go fishing, and so forth. That's great if you've got a boat, but boats are very expensive to, to own and operate, and not that many Inuits have access to boats. So what we're seeing is, on the one hand, in the communities, those, 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 those households that have access to cash income are able to adapt, but those that don't aren't. So we've seen the emergence of winners and losers to a certain extent in, in a climate change uh, uh, context. But perhaps of greater concern is, is changes affecting these broader factors which underpin Inuit adaptability. So if you, use, if you look at resource use flexibility, for instance, this flexible use of the environment has historically underpinned the ability of Inuit to adapt to significant environmental, environmental change. What we've seen over the last 30 or so years is the Canadian government coming in and setting quotas, determining what people can hunt, when, 
and where, thereby constraining the use of the environment by, by Inuit. Uh, if we look at traditional knowledge systems, a key concern which really came up across all our case studies was the fact that increasingly this traditional knowledge is not being passed on to the younger generations. So younger people are still hunting, they're still traveling, but they don't often have the knowledge of how to do so safely and successfully. So on one hand, the climate's changing. It's making it more dangerous for people to go out in the environment. But for many younger generations, they don't have the knowledge and skills to identify those dangers and deal with them. I'm talking here of skills like how to prepare to go hunting, how to assess trail safety when on the ice, uh, those kind of skills. Again, Tristan's going to talk about, a bit more about these at, at, at the end. We'll give us some more photos to give you some kind of context of what we're talking about here. This is in a Callowitz. This is uh, hunting at a flow edge. Again, this is where the, the kind of stabilized ends. It becomes a, a mixture of moving ice and, and open water. People hunt seals here. Very, very good environment for seal hunting. This is a picture of one of the kind of hunters. He's shot a seal. He's now in his boat trying to retrieve that seal from the, from the ice flows. Here's Tristan in, in Ulahaktok, in Northwest Territories. Very, very cold, as you can imagine. So what happens then, when we look then at the impacts of climate change that we're seeing in the Arctic, the visible, the visible manifestations of climate change, such as people getting into danger when hunting, uh, uh, people having constrained access to hunting areas, and, and, and so forth, when we look in depth at what's going on through in-depth community-based fieldwork, what we find is that it's not climate change per se that's driving the vulnerabilities that we see. It's non-climatic factors which are increasing the sensitivity and constraining the, the adaptive capacity of people to deal with those changes. So things such as the erosion of traditional knowledge. It's one of the main factors creating people who are vulnerable to the changes in climate uh, that, we, that, we, that we see. So what this means then is that when we look at adaptation and the question of can we adapt, these non-climatic factors in many cases are acting as barriers to adaptation, not limits. And barriers can be addressed through policy intervention, through community mobilization, and, and so forth. And a key, a key component of the work that, that, that Tristan and myself are doing at the moment is trying to find out which of these potential interventions has the most likely, the best chance of working. And some of the things that we're looking at are things like harvester support mechanisms, which provide resources for hunters to be able to afford to adapt. Land skills training, whereby elders and experienced hunters take youth out on the land to learn these important traditional skills. These are what we call entry points uh, uh, for adaptation. And I think what's important about these is they, they all have benefits regardless of, 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 of climate change. Even if climate change is a big hoax, as some conservative commentators say it is, these, these policies have benefits today regardless of, of, of that. But they're also key to reducing vulnerability to future climate change. That said, doesn't mean that climate change is, is not important. Uh, and certainly, when we look to the future and the viability of the Inuit subsistence hunting economy, part of it will depend upon how a number of key animal species will be affected by climate change. So species such as seals, caribou, muskox, narwhals, these are all key species in Inuit diet, uh, very important for food security. Uh, they all depend to some extent on the sea ice and the snow-covered landscape. Uh, we don't quite know how these species might be affected by climate change. The science is uncertain in a number of cases, but does point towards potential declines in numbers and certain changes in population health and migration, ti migration timing. So the big question really becomes is, can the population numbers of these species support Inuit harvesting uh, into, the, into the future? That's a question where we, we just don't know uh, uh, at, at present. One thing we do know, though, is that if multiple species are affected by climate change, the impacts will be increasingly pronounced. Because what we see at the moment in communities is that if one species is not available or accessible, people switch species quite freely. Um, so in the Calvet where I work, seals become very hard to get because of changing sea ice conditions. So people are hunting more caribou. Caribou is taking over in terms of supplying people the food that they need. But what we're seeing at the moment with climate change impacts is that caribou populations are also being affected as well. So there's a big concern uh, uh, there. Okay, so that's the kind of subsistence harvesting uh, uh, sector. Let's now finish off by looking at community health. And can we adapt to climate change in this, this context? 
Well, first thing we look at health, I think it's important to, to define what we mean by health. And getting the work that we do is the WHO definition, in which health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And so I think this is a kind of conceptualization of health which fits with Inuit's health, which is a more holistic view of, of, of health. And if we look at health in this manner, we see that Inuit health is sensitive to climate change in a number of ways. For instance, the importance of traditional foods. As I've already mentioned, we're seeing traditional foods becoming more difficult to access with, with climate change. Those foods are highly nutritious. When they're not available, people have to rely more on store foods. One thing that we know about the Arctic is store foods are often very, very expensive and often nutritionally inferior to traditional foods. We also have cultural ties to the land. There has been work that has shown that you know, people's mental well-being is very much tied to their ability to get out on the land, to hunt, to go to cabins, and so forth. Yet with this becoming more dangerous and more difficult, there's concern about some of the potential mental health impacts that climate change uh, may have. And then there's also the, 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 the danger aspect, the direct risks to physical health of, of traveling in a changing Arctic with more thin sea ice conditions and changing weather conditions and so forth. Now, all the work that Tristan and myself have done has focused upon food security, basically the ability to access a food of a sufficient quality. Um, and already we're seeing food security being constrained by some of the changes that, we, that we're seeing and across our communities. There's been noticeable declines in, in, country, in traditional foods available at certain times of the year. What we see is a very distinct seasonality to food, secure, food insecurity in a changing climate, in that it's during the fall time, when the ice is freezing, that we see some of the most, most pronounced food security implications. Because at this time of the year, we're seeing it taking much longer for the ice to reach a thickness at which it can be safely uh, uh, used. And this, these food security implications don't affect everyone the same. Uh, you know, some hunters are able to adapt through, through their technology, through their traditional knowledge, and, 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 and so forth. But others aren't. And still the work of ourselves and others has identified significant con concern over food security with regards to those people who rely on sharing networks to access food. Food sharing is very important through which traditional foods are distributed within Inuit communities. What we're seeing is that as it becomes more difficult to hunt, as there's less food to go around, sharing networks tend to con consolidate. Uh, for those people who rely on that sharing, it can be a big challenge. Um, limited household income. Poverty rate, rates of poverty in the Arctic Inuit communities are very, 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 very high. And for, some for some community members, traditional food is all the food that they can afford to, to eat. And also females and the elderly, we've also identified as being, of, of being, of, of having acute sensitivity to some of the food security implications of, 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 of the, ch the changes that we're seeing. But again, when we look at food security, we also see the Inuit are adapting in a variety of ways. Uh, we're seeing a number of adaptations. Food sharing, for instance, is very common amongst Inuit communities. It's changing, it's weakening, but still remains a core component of Inuit identity, to share food within your household units, with your family, and with your friends. So what this means is that some of those people who are on the losing end of climate change, who can't adapt, who can't hunt, that these food sharing networks can come in and help supply them with the food that they, that they need. We have food switching. You know? If it had been 60 or 70 years ago, some of the changes that we're seeing today may have resulted in starvation because people relied 100% on the food that they caught. Today, today, all communities, they have stores which stock store foods. So we don't, we don't longer see starvation today when hunting is difficult. And even 60 years ago, people in the Arctic and Canada died of starvation. Uh, today, that's not going to happen. People are able to, to switch food uh, and use store foods. And again, the fact that Inuits were adapting should come as no surprise. There's a long history of Inuit adaptation, as I recently mentioned. And so these social networks and resource use flexibility have historically underpinned this ability. But also, there are challenges to a number of these adaptations that we're seeing. For instance, food sharing. I already mentioned how with declining access of traditional foods, we're seeing snow sharing networks consolidating. Uh, food switching. There's the issue of cost. Store food is very is very expensive. Just look here in this photo here. $8.65. It's the same, the Canada and US dollars is the same conversion as one to one uh, per kilogram for bananas. You've got to like your bananas pretty much to, 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 pay, to pay that kind of, that kind of uh, amount. And indeed, the food that you buy in a store in Arctic Canada is at least twice as expensive 
as what you pay down south. In many cases, it's three times as high. And your average incomes are lower. So switching from traditional foods to store foods comes with a significant cost. And for those, household, for those households living in poverty, it's a very, very, it's a very, very big, big challenge. And likewise, with these broader factors which underpin Inuit adaptive capacity, we're also seeing changes and, and challenges here as well. You know, I already mentioned the weakening of social networks, um, but also this resource use flexibility. We're seeing a big, de big decrease in how, or big change in, in how Inuit use their environment. So in a Calibet where I work, um, going back to the 1980s and 1990s, it was estimated that hunters in a Calibet were exploiting an area of about 120,000 square kilometers. It's a huge, huge area. Um, but in my work that I did just recently with the GPS units, we estimated that it was more like 50,000 square kilometers today. We're seeing people hunting in a much, much smaller uh, location. And one of the reasons for this is because of a decline in the hunting camps. Um, going back to the 1960s and 1970s, when Inuits traditionally lived in small, semi-nomadic hunting camps. But in the 60s and 70s, people were forced into these fixed communities. But for about 20 or 30 years, people, people still maintained small camps on the, on the land. Camps often at significant distance from the, from the main community. What, what happened was that many of the, the families would live at these hunting camps, and they would send back food to the community. They'd be hunting full-time at their camps eating the food they catch, but also sending food back to the communities, to their families. And what this did is it spread the hunting activity out over a huge area. Um, but we've seen in recent years there was a decline, in many communities, a decline in the number of, 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 out, of these outpost camps in operation, spatially contracting the harvesting area, and again, reducing the, the area that can be exploited for, for hunting activities. So again, when we look at some of the health, the health implications, what we see is that it's not climate change per se, but it's climate change in the context of social and economic and cultural changes, which is creating vulnerability. And when we look here, the barriers to adaptation are quite significant. We have very high rates of poverty, sharing networks are coming under stress, and we have high baseline food insecurity in communities, which is exacerbating impacts. These are pretty significant barriers to, 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 to address. Uh, but nevertheless, interventions are possible, and some of the things that are being talked about in an adaptation context include you know, re-establishing these outpost camps to spread the hunting activities over a huge area, uh, or to invest in community hunters, people who are hunting full-time for the community, bringing tra tra traditional foods back, which are then freely available, say, through community freezers for community members to, 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 to access. Okay, so to, to conclude so far, and Justin is going, to come up, is going to come up in a minute with a case study, uh, I posed the question basically, can we adapt to climate change in the Canadian Arctic? And I kind of looked at two main sectors, subsistence hunting and, and health. Uh, I think at one scale that, that yes, adaptation, we can adapt. Uh, adaptation is taking place. Inuits are extremely resourceful and are drawing up on a history of adapting and responding to, to environmental change. Uh, adaptation is here now possible. There's ways in which community mobilization policy intervention and so forth, can support communities adapt to some of the changes uh, that we're seeing. And in many cases, the adaptations are about targeting the non-climatic drivers of vulnerability. And I would argue this is the same whether it's the Arctic or in many different contexts. Often a key part of adaptation is about targeting these non-climatic factors that create vulnerable populations. I think to some extent this is an, a more empowering message. We often hear about climate change in the Arctic and people saying that you know, climate change threatens the Inuit way of life. Um, suddenly it, it poses significant challenges. But in this kind of framing, it brings climate change back to the level of the community. It shows that there are things that people, communities, can do in response to climate change that could be effective in reducing vulnerability. I'm not here downplaying the risks posed by climate change, though. And certainly there will be significant impacts, and adaptations will also involve uh, significant uh, uh, costs. So first of all, thank you, Johanna Mustelin, for inviting us to be here at Griffith. This is a neat opportunity to share the northern Canada with Australia. And I know, you know many of you probably think of the Arctic as being very foreign and um, kind of a mysterious place. So what I'm going to do now, hopefully in a really quick way, but also in a, in a way that will entice you to learn more about the Arctic, is to share some examples from a case study, one of the case studies amongst the many 
that James described, but it's a place that I work um, in and I work closely with the people there. And I really want to provide the context to some of the issues that James has described. So the map here is uh, a zooming in. You can see the little inset is Canada with Alaska up into the corner. It's zoomed into the Western Canadian Arctic. If you think of the Western Arctic, including Alaska, this is really the canary in the coal mine for climate change. So this is somewhere where we've seen up to two to three degrees increase in temperature already. But it's not really temperature that's, um, that's the only driver of stress in, the, in, in this region. Temperature translates into all sorts of other impacts that affects the people living there. And that big dot there with the community Ulahakto is a community of about 400 Inuit. And they live in, here's a photo of an aerial view, they live around that, that bay. And you must think, why, why is there a community so far away from any urban setting, any major population center, way off in the Canadian Arctic? And what's interesting is these are very recent communities. So in the case of Ilahakto, it's really characteristic of most communities across the Canadian Arctic in that it's a new community. The last family to move from a semi-nomadic lifestyle on the land in the, to the community wasn't until the late 1960s, early 1970s. So when you think of these communities and you consider things like community viability, we're only dealing with 40, maybe close to 50 years of settlement. And this is where we really need to have the starting point. So for a lot of people, you hear the word hunting and you go, oh my goodness, killing an animal, oh, how dare you? You know, I'm a vegan, I'm a vegetarian. It's very difficult to be a vegetarian or a vegan in the Arctic environment. And Inuit, they subside off of hunting and fishing. So it's very context specific. And previous to living in the communities, Inuit would travel based on the animals. Wildlife would move and Inuit would follow them. Now living in permanent settlements, it faces some restrictions on their flexibility and ability to adapt to things like changes in wildlife patterns. So some photos just to give you the context. I would describe these as modern Arctic settlements. So we have um, that pink building is an art shop. There's a church. Um, it's a most of the communities, all but one, are coastal. So they're very dependent on that coastal marine environment. Um, heavily subsidized. So these communities and the viability of them are heavily subsidized, in this case, the rest of Canada. So they're very dependent on imports of food from the south. They're heavily dependent on imports of fuel. And in the case of Ilahakto and, and many of the communities, every year a barge will come once a year and provide all of the fuel for the community because they run off diesel generators for electricity and heating and also all the per non-perishable foods. So you have very remote communities that are also very dependent on um, external infrastructure, which also plays into this idea of how do you adapt to change? Who's responsible for, for adapting and providing the resources to adapt? It's also summertime. You know, it's not always winter. Um, it's interesting in the Arctic, you get the two opposites. You either get that cold, dark winter, 24-hour darkness. So in the Canadian winter, say from December, January, February, it'll be 24-hour darkness, no sun. Minus 30, minus 40, you know, temperatures. A very polar cold. But in the summer, you get the reverse. It's really neat. The sun just goes around in a circle all day long, 24 hours. And again, you have open water, so accessibility to a lot of resources. This community, roughly 400 people, 98% Inuit. So that's the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Essentially, Inuit in the language, Inuinukta or Inuktitut, means human, one, a person. So Inuit, Anuk is singular for person, Inuit are people. So the indigenous people here uh, make up the large majority of the people living in the communities. And as a result of the, the recent settlement in these communities, family ties, kinship groups are very important. So culture plays a major role here. And, and I'm going to reinforce some of the issues that James mentioned because this is really the, again, one of the starting points when we talk about impacts from a changing environment on people and on livelihoods. For many people in the South, you think, well, if you can't go hunting, oh, you should just go over to Coles and, you know, pick up a frozen pizza. It's interesting when you go into the Arctic. Uh, coming from a perspective, myself too, where, where hunting, I was not as exposed to it. Going to the Arctic, really being Inuk, being Inuit, is being a hunter. They're one and the same. So as far as the cultural well-being, pride, self-worth, it's all tied to hunting. Food, paramount for food, James mentioned. The nutritional quality of the food that you can get from the land 
far superior than you can get from a box of crackers or frozen pizza at the store. So even in Australia, we often hear about the, the, the um, disconnect, um, the inequalities among, uh, with health among urban Australians or non-Indigenous and then Indigenous Australians. We see the same thing in the Arctic. You know, um, different indicators of health in the Arctic uh, show that there's, there's definitely inequalities. High rates of obesity, higher um, rates of, of, of uh, cardiovascular diseases, um, lower life expectancies. So there's a real disconnect. And the reason is, is that now living in communities, people are starting to eat more store-bought foods, a change in diet. But when we know that a traditional diet is actually much healthier, income, people get money. You sell a pelt, you get money. Uh, sometimes you sell food, you get money. It's really driving now the ability to hunt is you get some money from, from hunting some species. And then cultural identity. Again, it's really integral uh, for an individual, both men and women, to be engaged in a hunting practice. So regardless of our politics on hunting, in this context and in this geographic and cultural setting, subsistence hunting is really paramount to culture. And uh, I always like to show some of the people we work with to try to bring you into these communities. We spend a lot of time in communities. I still spend a lot of time in communities, two months, four months, five months at a time, on a side of an island with, with 400 people. It's almost like Big Brother if we were living just together in here for four months. Uh, the first is Adam Kudluk, um, you know, 40-year-old hunter. So when we deal with the people in their 40s, these are individuals that I'd call settlement reared. They grew up in the community, but their parents were born on the land, you know, born in snow houses. They knew a subsistence lifestyle. Roland Otina, he's a little bit younger. Roland's in his uh, late 20s. So again, this is someone that grew up in the community. So he never knew what it was like to be full-time on the land. And interestingly, I include Harold right here. This is a non-Indigenous person who's lived in the Arctic since he was in his early 20s. And that comes into play when we talk about traditional knowledge and who holds traditional knowledge and whether or not you have to be, in this case, Inuit or Indigenous to hold that knowledge. And I would argue you don't. Um, and in this case, Harold is someone that, again, grew up in a very subsistence lifestyle and holds a lot of knowledge related to the environment that's very relevant for adapting to change. So first of all, we hear this, this term traditional knowledge or traditional environmental knowledge. And often in the literature, it's presented as a loaded term. You can call this uh, indigenous knowledge, sometimes local knowledge. Uh, you name it, there's all sorts of different terminology. In this case, we adopt the term traditional environmental knowledge meaning traditional knowledge related specifically to aspects of the environment, wildlife, and other interactions. Just some key points. Um, again, we could spend a lot of time dealing with traditional knowledge generally and with Inuit specifically, but some general points that apply across the board is that traditional environmental knowledge is a cumulative body of knowledge, practices, and values. And it's interesting, actually. You rarely see that, that word values placed in there. So traditional knowledge is not just about knowing how to drive on the ice, shoot a rifle, it, it's part of it, but, but values. Um, for example, in Inuit society, James mentioned the value of sharing, food sharing networks. It's not just sharing with anybody. It's certain parts of the animal go to certain people. And as a result, food security becomes more, more secure because you know that that food's being distributed in an equitable and culturally appropriate manner. It's cumulative because it builds over time. So you're building on the past, but you're also incorporating uh, new experiences, new technologies with the new. It's really about acquired through experience. So traditionally, in the Inuit society, traditional knowledge was built up through hands-on experience, observation and apprenticeship on the land uh, with an elder or a more experienced individual. It's also passed on through oral teachings, because again, it's, it's, it's building on the past. Sometimes you'll hear the word traditional knowledge and you think traditional old. You think, wow, it must be from the past. Well, it's quite the contrary. Traditional knowledge is dynamic. It's very flexible. It's adaptable. And it's continually updated and revised in light of new conditions or experiences. And this is a very important point. Because when you think, wow, in the past, Inuit lived a semi-nomadic lifestyle, and they coped with the environment and they adapted. Now they're living in a community. Well, you're right. A lot of those traditional adaptive strategies are no longer feasible. People can no longer pick up and, and move to where the caribou are, are moving. They're not as flexible. It's a lot of times that you're constrained with wage employment. But that traditional knowledge has become very flexible and adaptable. They're hunting in much more um, 
confined areas closer to the community. They're using different techniques. They're using different technologies. Some people would say that, wow, if someone's hunting with modern equipment, and I hear this in Australia, when they say, oh, you can't hunt a dugong with a rifle, that's not traditional. I would argue that's not the case. Inuit hunt with rifles, why? It's efficient. So they've adopted that new technology, but still the ability to find that animal and the ability to use that animal and the values that are, are in place to harvest that animal and share it are really based in tradition. So why is this linked or how is this linked to adaptation? Well, geez, across the board, we think of all these adaptive strategies. For example, you think, well, if the ice is melting sooner, well, you might need a boat. You might have to travel by boat. And you know what? You might have to harvest an alternative species. Maybe you need to hunt um, muskox on the land rather than seals on the ice. Well, uh, in this case, what really underpins it is your knowledge and the ability to do so. So when we think about traditional knowledge, it really underpins all these other adaptations. You're not even going to go on the land unless you have the skills and knowledge to do so. I also relate back to values. So when we start to talk about collective adaptation, food security is all about working together. Well, the value of working together, sharing food, is all based in traditional knowledge in the case of values. So when we look at traditional knowledge, it underpins adaptation across the board. But what it also does specifically for subsistence is it means it's response with experience. So you're not just dealing with a, your first time experience, but you're building on the experiences from oral history, you're building on the experiences from your, your father or your other teachers. And then again, passing your experiences on to, uh, to others. I can really boil this down into three categories. Flexibility, your ability to be flexible in light of change. This means knowing how to travel in alternative areas, harvesting alternative species, hazard avoidance, understanding when conditions are changing, having intimate knowledge of that ice, and being able to avoid some of those hazards, which in many cases in the Arctic lead to injury and, and often death in the last few years. And also emergency preparedness. So you see, this is Adam Kudlak. He's preparing the sled. He's, he's got a ring seal on the back. He actually harvests that seal in an open water lead in the middle of February. You usually never get open water in the middle of February, but he's adapted. So rather than be able to travel over the ice and maybe hunt, um, an, access another uh, terrestrial environment, hunt muskox, in this case, there's open water. Seals are available. He's adapted. He's got a small open water boat. He's taken his sled out, and he's harvested a seal in that condition. And the reason is, is that he has the ability to be flexible. Now, something that James alluded to was, there's a real concern in the Arctic and globally, is that there's this increasing globalization, urbanization, and a de-skilling amongst younger generations. These younger generation are the people who were raised in the communities, their settlement reared. They never had that first-hand experience living semi-nomadic. And if you're interested, we empirically tested the transmission of environmental knowledge and land skills amongst Inuit men, Inuit hunters, in Ilahakto, um, and it's published in Human Ecology. But what we did was, rather than just talking about, oh, people aren't learning, young people are losing their knowledge, we empirically tested that. We found some interesting insights. I'll just describe two of them. One is the depth of knowledge. So again, this is Roland. He's in his late 20s. It's another example of someone who is, um, I guess, one of the star hunters. He was learned from his father, who was an elder. But what we see across the board with depth of knowledge is that there's a real decline. And these numbers, the first column, the smaller number, is people between 18 and 34 years old, people who grew up in the community. This is Rollins in this category. The next one, 35 to 49, these are people who had some experience on the land or lived with a family of parents that were, grew up on the land. The last one are elders. These are people that lived 100% um, nomadic subsistence lifestyle. So of course the skills were transmitted fully amongst them. What those relate to is the, uh, the level of attainment of a skill. So while many of these guys can pick up a rifle and go shoot a caribou, very few of the younger generation actually know where to go to hunt caribou and why. What I mean is, knowing their location is one thing. Oh, the caribou are here. But then understanding why do caribou like that region is a whole other question. And it becomes very important because under climate change, the, uh, the habitat for wildlife is changing. Flora and fauna is changing. Caribou are moving. If you understand that, that dynamics, you're able to adjust. If you, you don't understand, you can't adjust. So what this points to is, a, is um, I guess you call, an inhibitor to the ability to adapt amongst this younger generation, this emerging generation. Now put that into context. In Ulahakto, um, over 50% of the community is under the age of 25. Across the Canadian Arctic, the fastest growing population are obviously the young people, the baby boom, and the older generation is passing.
So if we want to talk about future climate change, that's what we're talking about. The elders are going to be gone. It's this younger generation who's going to have to deal with, cope with, adapt to the changes. And again, we can look at that with muskox and polar bear. And for those of you that have never seen a muskox, does it, you know what a muskox is? Ha! Ah, no, I'm kidding. Muskox. Picture a, a woolly mammoth. Have you ever seen a woolly mammoth? Picture a smaller one about the size of like a big bull. Curved horns, big boss on its head. Um, they have hooves and they, they go in packs. Uh, they're an ungulate. Long, long kiviate fur. It's actually warmer than wool. Considerably warmer than wool. That kiviate's very... Um, yeah, like, okay, well, I, I had a photo I, I, afterwards, muskox, um, and they taste delicious. Inuit, Inuit, uh, would, would like me to say that. Okay, here's another finding, fathers and grandfathers, transmission rates. If you, have, if you were adopted by your grandfather, 18 to, 34, 18 to 34 years old, if you're adopted by your grandfather, you're learning these skills. You're becoming a very proficient hunter. You're providing for your community. If you were to have a biological father, you're also learning. You have to have a teacher in your life. No father, many of these skills are being lost. We have an emerging generation of female-headed households. Impossible in the past, because it was in partnership, but now very feasible with the welfare state today. No father, no teacher, and we have a lot of young men not acquiring the hunting skills. So this calls for some institutional intervention. And many of the communities, Inuit communities, are taking action. They're acknowledging we're losing some of our skills. We need to take action. I want to play a short little video of an exciting project funded by Health Canada, which is called Nunaminili Hakvia. It's called Translates to Learning from the Land. Um, and it's a project that's at trying to address this loss of skills amongst both men and women, specifically related to winter seal hunting, skin and fur preparation. You might think, why is that important? Well, the winter, the cold months, is the time when the most, most people if they are going to be food insecure, is that's when they're food insecure, where they don't have um, ready, uh, the availability of food and the, the quality and quantity of food is compromised. So in this case, country foods. So seal hunting becomes very important because that's a species that's available in the winter. A little link beforehand. James mentioned that subsistence hunting is important for health generally. It's amazing, even when you see this video, sewing, the skin preparation, the activity itself is paramount to that, that mental health, that physical health, and really the well-being of the community. So I will play this for you. This is the intro video just to share what the program is about. It ran over a year and it's going to start again for the next year. It's an example of, in this case, uh, community, the community drives this, but it has institutional intervention in that Health Canada has provided money. So they provided money to get this going, they provided some structure. With the men, they're doing equipment making and, and going out on the land with elders and teachers and learning how to hunt seal. With the women, they're learning how to prepare those pelts, um, sew them for clothing, so they make shoes, gummocks, and uh, parkas. Um, so it's really that intergenerational transmission of knowledge, particularly for individuals in the communities who don't have teachers in their lives. It was interesting. I, I really like what Adam says there when he says he calls it a nook pride. You know, it's about you know being proud of the self worth, um, just being part of that that hunting culture. I think he really embodies that in that last um, moment. And in a lot of the climate change dialogue and rhetoric, we hear it as very disempowering. You know, the impacts: angry summer, floods, fires. It's always this negative, negative, negative. Yet when we flip now and we talk about this idea of, of traditional knowledge and re, re, really reinvigorating some of those traditional um, ways of transmission in some of these skills programs, it's very an empowering dialogue. So I find that very encouraging. And I also see in the communities you know, a very positive outlook with change, very accepting outlook with change. Um, and they see this idea of, of passing on and using traditional knowledge to adapt as empowering rather than what we hear often in the dialogue is disempowering. And I think we can see that across the board, and I'm sure we can see examples from within Australia and internationally. And on that note, um, you can see some of uh, the people we need to acknowledge here, some of the key funders of this work. But again, I'd like to thank um, Johanna and, and Griffith University for having us, and we'd be happy to answer any questions.